presenter and nonprofit organizational interest with a specialty in Jewish community building. He's former rabbi of Bethel Synagogue in Minneapolis, senior federation executive, and executive director at the National Foundation. Rabbi Herring is uniquely suited to bring an outside perspective and research a couple of real-world experience to inspire organizations to achieve their greatest impact. Rabbi Herring believes that leadership is fundamentally about creating a practical future by understanding the risks of focusing energy on the and possibilities. Rabbi Herring also holds a PhD in organizational management. He's built a reputation as an organizational visionary, entrepreneur, and expert consultant for congregations, Jewish organizations, and other socially responsible nonprofit organizations. Rabbi Herring works with nonprofits to cultivate leaders who can translate the organization's relevance to new generations and better engage individuals in the work that they do. Uh, this morning, Rabbi Herring is conducting a workshop with all of us. It's called Inspiring Community Through Practices of Engagement. During this workshop, worship, workshop excuse me, we will draw on the congregation's recently revised mission statement and insights from all of the bars we given this weekend as a framework for re-envisioning the congregation called me as an engagement congregation. It's my pleasure to introduce you. Thank you. Uh, so we're about to prove that there is no such thing as a free meal, and this is really the point at which you get to bring your expertise. Okay? There's a certain perspective I have, but I will never know as much as you will about your congregation. So we'll bring together theory with real world work while you're finishing eating. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, while you're finishing your meal, I'm going to quickly run through uh, the last part of the presentation. And I'd like you to try and focus on it because in a few minutes you'll be getting to work to think about what you can do right here and I hope beginning tomorrow. And we had a couple of technical glitches, so we had a backup to a backup to a backup. Wait. And that's because of Sharon and the committee, whom I want to thank. Um, Rabbi Siegel, whom I want to thank. And also uh, a great tribute to a colleague of mine, former colleague, Rabbi Joe Wasser, of blessed memory. I hope this continues his spirit. But more than that, points all of you forward because you have within you tremendous resilience and creativity and innovation, and you can do this work. So with that, we're going to begin. The other thing I want to do is, if I can just borrow a copy of my book. Um, on my website, www.iamherring.com. If you'd like to order my book, I left your precedent and discount code. I was able to speak with my publisher and makes for a very good board read to go through chapter by chapter. Um, what it has is exercises and tools and practical experiences based on other congregations that I can't go into today. So, we're going to begin with uh, inspiring practices of engagement. Engagement we spoke about over the weekend as being focused on a mission, which you've done that work, but now internalizing it so that it becomes your filter for what you do and for what you don't do. What you don't do is sometimes more important than what you decide to do. We tend to do the things that don't really give us the biggest impact because they're a little easier and more comfortable. So being mission focused, using your mission as a filter, nice to have it on a mug, a t-shirt, a banner throughout the building. Every board meeting and committee meeting should begin with a quick review of the mission statement, and you'll be surprised how much more focused you can become. A second principle is then generating momentum. When you have that mission focus, right, and there's a cadre of leadership who know it, who can recite it in their sleep, then you're able to open up your structure a little bit, 
and within the mission, allow for more experimentation and then a little bit more risk taking. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So if we want to go um, advance two slides, please. So, I guess I did that. We're making progress already. One more. Now, what Sharon will be doing, I'm not going to be a spoiler, um, I'm going to let her do it in a minute. Diversity is a key to innovation. Why is it that the same problem seems to keep yielding the same result? When you put the same people at the same table, well, of course, you're generally going to get the same result. So the methodologies that I use always involve mixing it up with different people, insiders and outsiders, young and old. Remember that going forward in the work that you'll do as, your, uh, as a community. <coughs> All right, let's skip that already. Um, just to tell you that this is not theory, but practice. I studied with a Lutheran colleague of mine. We looked at congregations that were as old as 150 years, and we looked at congregations that were between 5 and 10 years old. Lutheran and Jewish. And what we found is that every congregation has the capacity to innovate. Not every congregation has the capacity to be entrepreneurial. And we'll go over the difference between the two, and you have to decide which one you want to be. One can lead to the other, but they're different. And you have to understand what the difference is in order to figure out what path you want to go on. Okay. And we had spoken about um, different kinds of structures of congregations today. Okay. The top-down model that many congregations still operate in, pushing information out, making decisions on behalf of, and that is in contrast to the engaged congregation where leadership plays a different role and that is again to keep the congregation on task with mission and to make sure that people can engage in bringing in their desires and talents and express and explore their own sense of what it means to be Jewish within the mission of the congregation. We're not saying hierarchies are no good. Hierarchies can be very important. When it comes to a service like Rosh Hashanah, you don't want a, lot, a whole lot of experimentation at the last minute. You need people to set things up in advance, right? Who've done it before. On a national scale, hierarchies help build camps, right? On the national level of different movements. Um, the federation system, was able to bring together on the turn of a dime in the late 1980s 250,000 Jews from all over North America to march in protest of freeing Soviet Jews. So it's not either or. There's a, a role for hierarchy, but there's also a greater role for innovation, which will come through smaller social network groups that you have. Right, why don't we advance to the next slide. So what's the difference? These words are used interchangeably. I'm just going to give this up. Um, I know this, and if I don't get quite everything, it'll be fine. You'll, you'll get to work. Um, these words are used interchangeably, but they're different. Why don't we advance one more slide? So in my mind, um, entrepreneurship it doesn't mean that we're going to wing it. I liken it to jazz music. If you've ever heard like really good jazz musicians play, and even though they've only practiced maybe for a little while together as a group, each individual has mastered their specialty so well, um, it's hours and hours of disciplined practice and that's why when you bring them together, they're able to just create magic when they're really good. They know when to solo and when to pull back. 
They know when to be in conversation with another one playing an instrument and when to play as a group. And that requires a tremendous amount of practice. It looks easy because they've worked so hard. Um, but the other element has to do with, you know, sort of a playground mentality. Right? We're going to play a little bit. And sometimes you can hear that sour note that's off, even in the best jazz musicians. Um, and that's okay because the other people around them know how to make it sound like it somehow fits in. So that's the difference between entrepreneurship. Um, it's really about both being a laboratory for experimentation, but also it means being really focused and disciplined and excellent at what you do. Innovation. Um, innovation is an act or a series of actions that can happen quickly or slowly and they can exist both within hierarchies and as I mentioned it before they may embolden a congregation to be more entrepreneurial I'm not sure that every congregation should be um, those that want to be I think we need a few outliers to help kind of push the culture of congregations but here in working with my co-researcher we have I think we did 20, 34 interviews. Established congregations, startup congregations, nonprofits, right? We wanted to take one step out from the congregational world but not get too far out there. And across the board, we found that regardless of size and age and budget, all were able to find ways to innovate, often without using any additional funding. Money helps, but money without vision and this sort of capacity to be, um, look ahead of the curve, won't get you very far. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say, you, we can leave it on that, that's fine. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about innovation very quickly is that don't look to innovate yesterday's best practices. Very often, innovation is associated with, why don't we look at congregation X, Y, or Z and see why is this working for them? That is almost a guaranteed recipe for a waste of resources. Because you can't cut and paste somebody else's innovation onto your culture. Right? You can learn from them, you can be inspired by them, but I really trust that you are smart enough to figure out what to make uniquely your own. The four patterns of innovation that we identified are reiterating the role, cracking the code, fusing the model, and breaking the mold. And the fifth one I'd like to ask for Rabbi Siegel's the cup of coffee that I asked for well over 10 to 15 minutes ago. There was a very wild party in my room uh, next to my room last night. One sugar, please, too. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next slide. Reiterating the role. And these are the four patterns of innovation that we found. And you're going to practice one of them today. The first one is reiterating the role. Now, I don't remember the Sesame Street uh, portion when my kids were young, but one of these things doesn't look like it belongs here. Somebody remember that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, one of these things is not like the other. This little white guy is a rabbi in Baltimore. His neighborhood did not gent gentrify. And the congregation had to decide, should we move or do we stay? So he reiterated the idea of being part of a covenant right, of a unique people, but also said we are one tribe of, of a global tribe of humanity. So Rosh Hashanah came along and they decided to de deliver their, as you can see, not distinctly looking Jewish neighbors, um, apples and honey. <coughs> 
to welcome themselves when they decided to stay, to become more engaged in the neighborhood. There was a need to help build a playground. They participated in it. One year, they skipped the apples and honey after they had been doing this for a few years, and the neighbors said, what happened? We missed talking to you. Right? It wasn't about the gift, it was the relationship. Um, another example, Shir Chadash. Anybody heard of it? Okay, I, I hope you probably haven't, most of you. Do you know why? It is a very unremarkable congregation, except they decided to do something with Shabbat services. They're located in Denver, Colorado. The rabbis there told me we would not have described ourselves as innovative, except the senior rabbi went on a sabbatical, and every Shabbat went to a different congregation around the country to see what Shabbat services were like. He came back with a, a vague idea of what could be different. He said, we're not LA and we're not New York, we're Denver. Meaning, we have to figure out what will work for us. He reiterated the role of a Shabbat morning service. Main service kept going with the cantor, but once a month to begin with, he began, thank you, the service is just fair, Rabbi Siegel, but thank you. <laughs> but, but, the hospita but the hospitality doesn't get better. Um, he reiterated the role by saying, no cantor, lay committee, I'm not going to be involved, I'm going to watch what they do. And he invited a group of very diverse people, long story short, about 250 people come once a month Okay, so it wasn't either or, it was both and. And by turning control over to lay people, by playing a guiding role to make sure that things were within the mission, suddenly inactive members started coming to services. People from other congregations began coming to services. And other people I can't reveal some of the letters that we got that were shared with us about the service. One woman described it as a lifesaver because her family had kind of abandoned ship and she started going, a daughter started going, whole family's back. More examples of reiterating the role, the point of reiterating the role is keep the core so that it's somewhat familiar and then keep adding enough elements where suddenly there's some freshness to it, where you look at words differently, the music is different. Um, that's how he reiterated the role, keeping the core service, but changing everything else around it, including personnel and himself. Cracking the code. So cracking the code gets back to the idea of knowing your mission and knowing what you can and can't do well. Um, we'll just take one example, ICAR, Los Angeles, you know, which is not a new congregation anymore. It's about 10 years old, 11 years old. And they decided that they wanted to tie together social justice, tefillah, prayer, and serious study, all interwoven together. And that's what they do. They tried a couple of other things around religious school. It didn't work well, so they partnered with somebody else who was really good at religious school education. Of course they had to do religious school education. Right? There are families with children. But when they got to the point where they realized that it was hurting their core mission, they figured out a way to work in collaboration with another organization and to do it a little bit differently. Why don't we keep going? Cracking the code, focusing deeply on what you do well, not excluding by partnering with others who can help you. Here's what you're going to be working on, so pay attention, um, special attention. Uh, fusing the model. Um, fusion, I think, is a nuclear process, right? Where electrons, what, what collides? Thank you. Wait, please. This is why we need young people, by the way. Help me out some. 
two atoms collide. And then they release a bunch of energy and become a fusion of themselves. So two hydrogens collide and become helium because they're um, you, nuclei. Um, okay, so you get an explosion of energy, right? Through fusion. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jerry. Um, when we talk about the future, I have that the people who are going to be living in it longer than certainly I will be. So I really appreciate your contribution. Thank you. Fusion gives you a release of energy. Um, when you mix together, and we'll just take a look at the Kavanaugh Cooperative, which is in Seattle, right? So what happens when you put together a model of a congregation with the model of a cooperative? Cooperative, of course, you buy into, people take ownership, and it only works if everybody plays a role. So again, it means releasing some control to the members of the cooperative, admitting what is not working, and in this case, the rabbi there said, bar and bat mitzvah education, like, why are we continuing this? The kids hate it, the teachers hate it, the parents hate it, and we didn't like it. So why don't we do something else? We have ownership in this. Even if we don't have children who are B'nai Mitzvah, we want their experience to be positive. Um, Romamu in New York fused the model of Eastern spirituality because the rabbi there is also um, very knowledgeable in Buddhism and also very knowledgeable in Judaism. So something will always be unique about that. Again, it doesn't mean it's what you have to do, it's the principle of fusion, which is the collision of two... Two atoms and their nuclei fuse, creating a new atom that's... Um, releases more energy and gives you things that you can't imagine until you um, bring them into collision with one another, Jeremy, right? Okay, Nobel Prize winner future, keep your eye on it. Let's go on to the next one. Breaking the mold. Um, not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one right now, but two organizations which we study are entrepreneurial, really in a different category because all of the other organizations, the Jewish ones, were based on Torah. Right? That was their DNA, correct me if I'm using that correctly. The DNA of Labshul and this other, pardon me, nonprofit called Ramon was actually arts and culture. That was their starting point. And it was a belief that with arts and culture as their foundational DNA, they could then reinterpret Jewish tradition for people who otherwise were not interested in it. And they have done some amazing things in bringing people who would never step foot in any Jewish organization. All right, why don't we go ahead? And now you're going to start to work, but Sharon has an announcement to make. Yes. Um, <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd rather have people at their tables before I explain. Okay, did anyone here not receive a little small colored piece of paper? We have, um, Nancy's gonna hand a few of them out. So there's one more over here. So the idea is to mix everybody up. You will see on, when you get, seated again, you'll see there are challenges on your table. There's this piece of paper. There is another piece of paper for you all to fill out. There are blank pieces of paper for you to add any other information you want to add, any other ideas you come up with, and there are pens. So for two minutes, we're going to ask everyone to get up, throw off all their trash, and then go to the table that has the big square of your color. Ready, set, go! No, you're darker. You're the No, that's our vision statement. We're doing our vision
we have like a concentric circle. We have a concentric circle that's taken care of and that's, and that's, and that's big part of it. So, but, we, but I think as we get further away from the that's what we call almost, yeah, so almost like an old type of thing. Like the further you get out, the harder it is to kind of grab on. You know, it has to keep the more light back to the bigger things in the world. There's a big I think that's the most important I'm thinking that we're talking about how we can do that. I think we can do that. But in terms of the interest of this, what's the quality of the interest of this? We have a barrier which is You have about five more minutes. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Ten minutes is ten minutes. And just do the best you can right now. Time to end discussion and just make some judgments. This is not going to be covered in C9. You'll have a chance to use this worksheet again. So don't worry about what my definition is. What does it mean to you? We have to be in order. Okay. What are the barriers? I think you have to do it. So the barrier is an understanding of our visual I just think it's like I think that people that you think that the younger people are So lack of understanding of vision and vision. So since we only have four minutes left, it's ten more done. Uh, how about we move on to opposite? I can't put anything down until the hundred seconds. I can't write anything down until the hundred seconds. Can't write anything down until the hundred seconds. Can't write anything down until the
even if you haven't completed everything, please begin winding down. So, so do you jump off a building and hope you'll live? Oh, wait, let me, 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 let me,
This is an important question and a very quick response to that based on lots of experience, lots of study. Um, you don't need to get you don't need to get a hundred percent of the details worked out. You have to be thoughtful and you have to plan. Yes, but you also don't move with zero percent of the details worked out. What I, I, I need to finish my statement. What you're saying is coming from somewhere and I I, I, I really I don't want to disrespect that because you, do I. you're right. Too often it's like the oh it sounds like a great idea, let's do it. That's not planning. Right. But the flip side is that taking two years to plan an idea, um, to take something simple, and I've coined this word, complification. <laughs> right? It's the act of taking something that should be simple and making it more complicated than it has to be. There's a middle point, and that is doing your due diligence, and you have to do it harder today because there's so much garbage on the web, you know, people search and they check, and you don't really know the quality of information anymore, but you have other tools. You have people in business, at universities, you have networks of friends, right? You have networks of people who maybe belong to other congregations. You have to vet things more carefully, but if you want to be responsive, it's got to be at a different pace. The 80-20 rule in a different way works for me. Work out 80% of the details very carefully. Start small, I mean think big. Start small, move fast, and evaluate as you go. It's a pilot. The other 20% you're not going to get, I guarantee you, by sitting in six more meetings. What you will get um, by piloting sooner is the other 20%. It's called an educated risk. Um, yeah, uh, you know, we can, we can give it different names, but the, the idea is faster, smarter, and also don't let a big dream, don't let fear get in the way of a big dream. Because if you put the right people around you, you don't happen. That's right. Yes. I echo what you said. Okay. I, 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 I had a feeling that we're... Yep. Yeah. Jeremy? It's about money. have a big dream, how are you going to accomplish that? If you don't have any money... Well, we're going to work on the challenges, and then will you ask that again at the end? The challenge was money. We're going to move on. Only be... <laughs> only be Uh-oh. I've, I've got future financial secretary. I've got two people looking at me right now and I'm kind of trapped in the middle. What's your question and I'll see if I can take it. It wasn't a question. I just thought that when you were talking about the planning for a rest, um, you know, part of the planning is looking at one and cons. And what you do is if their pros are right there, right. that's a good thing. The cons you just have to figure we're, out. We're going to hold maybe. off on that. But yes, yeah. let's keep moving. Here's your innovation challenge. We're going to use the practice of fusion. Uh, do you have an IKEA near here? Yes. Yeah, like who doesn't? Um, and that's why I like to use IKEA. Here's what I'd like you to do, and let's go to the next slide. So, in working with Sharon and the committee, we've laid out 10 challenges, 11 challenges because you're overachievers, um, <laughs> despite what you may think, I, there's a lot there, of what would happen if you fused IKEA's model with a congregational model. Meaning, imagine for a moment that IKEA was in the business of creating spiritual communities. If you applied their simple, modern design, ready-to-assemble, eco-friendly principles, to deepen engagement in a way that was true to your mission, what might your challenge look like? And now you're going to work in groups. And I would say, um, time-wise, yeah. you have a form. One of you should record the information. 
We won't have time to hear from everyone. And it's not going to be a reporting back, but it's more about the process of what you've learned in addition to the content of what you've learned. So I'd like you to take about 30 minutes and to really go a little deeper now and think about the pros and the cons of what the pros and the cons to our financial secretary, thank you, um, in applying these principles to the challenge before you. Also, there are pictures of the building that might help rethink, uh, repurpose some of the space. What do you have as an asset that could be used in thinking of your challenge? You have 30 minutes to begin working um, and complete the form. So the 30 minutes will include a little bit of discussion, completing the form. You have an additional sheet of paper on your table that's empty. If any ideas come up that are worthwhile that don't quite fit your challenge, record them on that separate piece of paper and that way they won't get lost. Does everything kind of fit in with everything? Would there be like rules there that like... Can you, but I mean, could you grab anything from that area and everything that area? They gave everyone a different right. yeah. uh, But it would... But it would all look like... But it would all look like... But it would all look like...